Why did people sail? For fun and adventure? No, the main purpose was trade or need for new lands. There was no reason to go the other way when the distance over land from anywhere in Europe or Africa across land or across the Indian Ocean was shorter than the distance it would take to cross the Atlantic Pacific Ocean if the Americas were just more ocean. At the time Columbus sailed across the Atlantic, the Americas were not known. Spain, on the other hand, had just expelled the Moors, in a century-long war, and the Moors were a part of the Umayyad Empire, the largest empire in the world at the time, depicted in brown, so Spanish trade overland to the Orient was closed and Spanish trade was blocked from going around the African coast by the Portuguese. Columbus made a desperate gamble, and so did the Spanish crown, based on an erroneous assumption. Columbus thought the world was much smaller than the intellectuals of the day claimed, he thought he could make it to China without running out of food and fresh water. He was dead wrong and almost didn't make it to the Americas. He finally made it across the Atlantic, in a trip that took over a month, even using sails and trade winds. They would have never made it to China. He got lucky. Genetics has also shown us how improbable contact was, with cases like that of malaria. It has been with tropical Africans since the beginning of human time and has spread with them wherever mosquitoes could survive. Yet no evidence of its existence in the Americas before colonial times. So whomever migrated to the Americas had to have been outside the malaria zone for so many generations that no one had exposure to the mosquitoes, the malaria, and with enough time for all genetic defenses to have been bred out. Any African American with sickle cell anemia can tell you that those genetic markers do not disappear quickly. Not even over a whole millennia. Malaria is thought to have been the greatest selective pressure on the human genome in human history. It has led to populations developing genetic traits that protect from malaria and are passed on generation to generation. Multiple genetic characteristics were formed, but I will only delve into three. The best studied influence of the malaria parasite upon the human genome is a hereditary blood disease, sickle cell anemia. The sickle cell trait causes disease, but even those only partially affected by sickle cell have substantial protection against malaria. Another well-documented set of mutations associated with malaria is that, known as thalassemias. They too, have popped up in areas of malaria, sometimes where sickle cell disease did not develop, offering a secondary form of protection. They too will accompany their descendants, in their genes, who migrate to non-malaria areas. Finally, you have the Duffy negative antigen. It was found that the majority of Afro-descent people were Duffy negative. 68% of African Americans and 88 to 100% of Africans were Duffy negative including more than 90% of West Africans. This phenotype is exceedingly rare in Euro-descent people and unknown on Native Americans prior to colonial admixture. None of these markers have been found in any human remains of Native Americans carbon dated before colonialism. Malaria along with other world diseases exterminated more than 90% of the population in the Americas. This clearly showed a lack of any sort of genetic protection, which would indicate a lack of African, European, or Asian presences for millennia. Yet, some will still argue, oh Cam's razor, if the stone heads look African and, not Native American they must be African. The problem with this argument is that they are not the proportions of real humans and as much as they do look human, they do look like Native Americans. Just not like your stereotyping of a North American native. You must look at tropical native populations. The assumption is that larger than life colossal sculptures are accurate in proportions in the first place. It is not only the nose and lips that are broad, the whole face is broad and flattened and you see no prognathism or dolucocephalism whatsoever. Classic traits of African populations constantly compared to the colossal Olmec heads. Finally, the eyes are just as broadened as the rest of the face. No human has eyes that big. Just to exemplify this I will do a little demonstration using a comparison of an Olmec colossal head and that of Martin Luther King Jr., may he rest in peace. I am enlarging the eyes of a sculpture of Martin Luther King Jr., so his eyes are proportional to that of an Olmec colossal sculpture. Now I am shrinking back the eyes, until they match MLK's actualized size, but I also shrunk the nose and mouth at an equal rate. As you see, the sculpture no longer looks so broad. The problem with sculptures is that in ancient times they were not trying to make proportional sculptures all the time. 
just a general representation that might exaggerate features they saw as important. If they saw the nose, mouth and eyes important they could have enhanced them more than what the person had in real life. They obviously did it with the eyes. To assume the rest of the face is proportional is disingenuous. We just don't know how much they exaggerated or not. Here is what Martin Luther King Jr. would have looked like if he really looked like that old mech sculpture. Obviously he looks like a cartoon, not a real human. With all due respect to one of the greatest positive change makers of our time, he was a proud African American, not an old mech. I have issued this challenge before, if you think that you know a person who looks just like a colossal head, post a picture. For me, I am well aware that the picture is just a generalized picture, and it describes Native Americans well, as seen by the life-size image the old mech made of one of themselves. Looking at old mech art overall, you see life-size stone images and jade masks that look just like Native Americans. Sure, you can nitpick and find some artifacts that could resemble Africans. You can also nitpick for those that look very Asian, or even some that look European. These artifacts also still look like natives as well. When you look at the life-size portrait of an old mech ruler, you see the broad features and lips in a clearly Native American face with long straight hair. Even looking at the profile of an old mech stone head you see the similarities to that of the King's Jade portrait, or that of a modern indigenous person. In fact, if you average all the old mech images out there to find the most common old mech face, you see a clearly indigenous face with broad features. Those features are still in existence today.